Disclaimer, in case I edit all of this and I realize <laughs> I come across incredibly sick, even though I really think I've been okay for sitting here for our like pre-recording conversation. It's just like pauses where I just look a little green. Um, I definitely have food poisoning, but I'm here and I'm recording anyway. Brianna's such a trooper. This Give her support only... in the comments for being a real one and pulling through and still recording when right. she just does not want to be a person i will um only include this in the recording if there are moments when i'm editing where i'm like oof i look rough i look like i'm gonna puke all over everything but um don't eat expired eggs folks don't eat expired eggs not knowingly you didn't do that knowingly no no of course i didn't and no one said just, them to me knowingly right just, I, again it was just my disclaimer just disclaimer yes. i don't want someone to be like why is brianna you know eating no, okay, okay. which no, no, no. we all, all okay anyway yes <laughs> i was trying in my brain right then like i feel like if i was fully like i had full brain capacity i would be able to make a good transition between like feeling sick and the results of the japanese gp but like all I, that's how as far with the witty transition that i got recording from new york and los angeles your hosts nicole katz and brianna klein are lined up on the grid for this week's grid walk engines are fired up ready to broadcast to you every thursday on youtube spotify apple and more subscribe like the video turn on auto downloads and leave a review to provide us with a fresh set of tires today grid walk will take pit stops at we are going to talk about lots of items today that happened at the Japanese GP, many of which made us sick, but some of which made us very excited. Start, and we're going to start with the fact that Max actually had to pass someone on track. And I said weeks ago that if Max had to pit and come out, out behind a car, he just didn't have a clear pit window, we would throw a celebration. So we're going to start the episode today with that celebration. Then we're going to turn our attention to the other Red Bull garage because Junior is just Red Bull Junior. And I'm going to beg everyone to please just give Yuki the senior Red Bull seat now, because I just I just want to see it. So we're gonna talk all about that. After that, we have our first real, I would say really strong lame duck segment of the year, considering there were some kind of team orders both in the Mercedes and the Ferrari garage. And I was a little shocked on how it all played out. So we are going to waddle over like little ducks into the lame duck segment. That was more clever in my brain. Again, foggy sick brain. <laughs> yeah, if you're not on YouTube, Nicole just pulled out her little duck and put it on. Uh, Rubber on ducks Jordan Elmo today. <laughs> Nicole has a Japan GP themed gossip grid for all of us today. And then we are also going to take a look at the recently announced partnership that Elf made with Catherine with Catherine Leach for the Indy 500. And while that's not F1, it's some of our favorite things, which is women race car drivers and makeup in a race that's incredible at the Indy 500. And of course, we have multiple podiums for the Japanese GP scattered throughout the show today. And with that, take it away, voiceover man. It's lights out and away we go on this week's grid walk. I don't even like podcasts. They make me fall asleep. I don't even like podcasts. I don't even like podcasts. They make me fall asleep. Oh my god. I don't even like podcasts. Max had like an ounce of a challenge at some point <laughs> in the race. Had to like kind of race and pass Charles. Woo! Woo! Racing! Racing happened! We. This I, <laughs> I promised before going into the Saudi Arabia GP, so the second GP of the season, that if anyone was in Max's pit window, meaning he had to actually pass someone on track that I would throw a party. And if you're not watching on YouTube, considering the fact that I have food poisoning, this is the best party I can throw. And because Max not did have to pass someone. today. No, yeah. no, no, no. This is not an alcohol day. But um, I, I'm now wondering if in the edit I need to put like a flash warning. But I tried to put it on like the most subtle light I, show possible. Well, I guess maybe subtly. I, well, I don't know. Maybe to just to be safe, but yeah, um, I didn't think that through until just now. But um, <laughs> yeah, so yes, here are all the disclaimers. Like Charlotte Claire was on a completely different strategy. Like there was no actual on track racing challenge per se. No. It's not that Max no. had to work hard to pass Charles. 
But the fact that he had to be in someone's dirty air for like even a fraction of a second yeah. is like the best that I've seen in actual challenge for the last year. Since the beginning of last year, maybe like maybe even earlier than that. Like, yeah, yeah like yes, remember. there's the anomalies like Singapore, but that wasn't that was an anomaly. Like, the, mm -hmm. the, he didn't have a clear Continued pit window. Anomalies. He didn't go in front of the entire field by thirty seconds, then got to pit and come out still in front of the entire field. This is a big deal. <laughs> there was a little bit of a there was actual pit. There was cars. He saw other cars. Max was able. It wasn't just like a lone race where he's like wow this is basically like free practice or a quality lap and it's just like you know he had to really think about the other cars around him and it wasn't just like to your point 30 seconds of space wow then in the end was it all just as we expected yes it was but that's not the point <laughs> No, I'm not here to be sad. I'm here to provide hope and in, and potential. Like, look, it, it is such a, like a sad state in F1 where like we're celebrating this, but it is Max getting any sort of situation in dirty air. We're like, race! <laughs> yeah, like, it really is not like, well, because he doesn't have a competitive teammate. So mm -hmm. it, I we wouldn't even say Ferrari had happen. the best most competitive weekend with Red Bull, but it doesn't matter. Because, because they split their strategy, which I also would like to congratulate Ferrari for understanding how to split a strategy. It's impressive. Didn't yeah. know you could do it. Didn't know you yeah. could do it, boys. Way to go. Right. And they and it both worked out. Both of the strategies worked, but yeah. they split it. They knew how to think about two strategies at once. Again, sounds very un-Ferrari. I don't know what's happening. People just getting certain things i mean figured out to an extent i'm still not in the place of like ferrari's it like there's still too much of a gap there you know right so i'm not if we we're playing red flags i'm still not boxing i'm pushing this lap push the slots exactly yeah i'm not there yet but way to go ferrari on not butchering up like a single strategy you got pretty solid on both Pit stops looking okay. It's 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 not a bad time to be at Ferrari or looking at Lewis Hamilton joining Ferrari next year. So <laughs> I don't think anymore now. I I stopped thinking a long time ago. I didn't yep. actually mean to hit that sound. That's my bad. <laughs> but, but you know, Charles sometimes maybe feel that way. Right. We didn't actually get. That's not what relevant this weekend. So. We'll just go back to celebrating too. I don't even like podcasts. They make me fall asleep. Yep. I don't even so like podcasts. They can't sleep in dirty air, Max. I don't even like podcasts. <laughs> it's the little things. That somewhere it is. I know. I'll put some funky music on it in the edit. <laughs> they make me fall asleep. They make me fall asleep. They make me fall asleep. <laughs> All right, DJ Brianna. You know, I have, I have my flashing lights and, yeah, and my definitely... soundboard. That's all I need. DJ BK. Step right up, step right up and see the wonders of the traveling motor circus. If I wasn't feeling so awful and sick right now, this segment would definitely be a soapbox because I'm at the place where I would just, I'm begging Red Bull to give Yuki the senior seat. Like, I just want to see it. I'm not even sitting here arguing that he'll necessarily be faster than Max, but we know that Perez isn't anywhere near Max, and we know Daniel Ricciardo isn't a driver anymore, really. So, and Yuki has like, it's totally unfair that like his anger and cursing on the radio has become this giant storyline because he really isn't any worse than any other driver. He, his just get put on the main feed because they make it inflammatory. And there's a slight language barrier. So I just, he is fast enough. And when has Red Bull cared about the drivers being rough around the edges when they put them in the senior seat? So it's like, it doesn't seem like it's ever gonna happen, but Red Bull, I am begging you 
to just make my life a little more entertaining and to give Yugi the shot. If Yugi leaves the Red Bull system when Honda does at the end of next year, and he's never gotten a shot in the senior Red Bull, like that's such a disservice to a driver who does seem to have like peaks of being really fast. Yeah. I mean, the highlight, I think, of this race weekend and you know, Yuki coming in with a lot of like good energy of having like this being a home race, but Yuki racing a Haas, like there, there was such like actual fun things going on that we were able to see. So I would love to see him in like a car that he could actually like really be pushing to the limit. Give me the Delulu. I would love to see it. I'm just seeing more and more. I'm seeing less reasons as to no and more reasons as to yes. But yeah, I think to your point of his radio history gets really twisted and blown out in a, in a way that makes it seem like it's so much worse than everybody else when it's not. So I don't know. I feel like they'll always have their reasons, but I'm seeing less and less of them. Yeah. George Russell has the same amount of yelling spurts on a radio every weekend. He just has a British accent. So <laughs> I, it's just the overtakes, the skills that it took for Yugi to make the overtakes he made this race weekend was incredible. We know he can be fast and the peaks of it is are so impressive. I just, not to mention, it would be incredibly entertaining to watch Yugi and Max be a teammate pairing. There's, that would be so out of pocket. I can't look. Right? I just, I would love it. Like, I, I have not seen, there's, Red Bull is so quick to put people in that senior seat, often too quick that they're putting people before they're prepared, that I am not used to being in a situation where I'm begging Red Bull to give a driver a chance in that seat because Yuki's put in his dues. It is a junior team. It is literally called RB. You can't pretend like it's another equal team. It's not. It's your junior team. It's your Take sister. your junior. Yeah, take your junior driver and put him in the seat, please. I just, you know, the yeah, longer like, it goes, just, it just makes me think it'll just not happen. But mm. it would be—I would be really sad to live in a world of Formula One where we never saw Yuki and Max go head to head as teammates, even if Max demolishes him. Like that's—that's that's at least going to be but entertaining. Just to know. Yeah. Right. Like right now, I'm living in this world where I feel like the Yuki who had the young driver rough edges. We're not seeing anymore. Like he's really pulled it together. He has a car that can decently compete for points and he's dragging the car there. He's mm -hmm. making his anointed next Red Bull driver teammate look silly. There's like, like put him in the seat. I want to see it. I mean, let's, it still just seems like they're committed to the cause with Checo here for a little like while, which, you know, we talked enough about last week. Yeah even though with a 13 second gap in between or whatever, 12 seconds, like I can't, I just give Yuki a shot. Do it. You won't, you won't. I dare you. Dare you. Triple dog dare you. Last week we talked a ton about how Japan moved from the end of the season to the beginning of the season. So now that we had the somewhat strange experience of having an April Japanese GP, this podium is my reasons Japan in April really rocked. In P3. There was less of chance for rain. I know we got one rained out day or so, and that didn't wasn't great. But this was still much better. Like, we had a dry Grand Prix, a dry quali, like, for the first time in what feels like years. And that might not be true, but that's how it feels. Like, my emotions feel like it's always raining in Suzuka, and the track doesn't need it to be good. So... I'm glad we got a dry race and that it's now at this time of the season where there is less chance for rain going forward. In P2. The early season uncertainty at this track in particular was so much fun. <laughs> uh, the earlier we are in the season, the less we know about all the cars, and that is really fun for a track that hits like when the teams don't know their cars forwards and backwards and totally understand what they're doing there's going to be deviation in pit stop strategy there's going to be teams that get it right and teams that get it wrong and the earlier it is in the season the more likely some of that stuff is going to happen and i think part of the reason this race this weekend was so fun to watch was 
because of all of that. So like, I would love to front load the season with all the best tracks, because this track is a banger even when we know exactly what's gonna happen. And it was even better not really knowing exactly what was gonna happen, except for Max, but you know, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, we know what you mean when like the, the, all of the unexpected things, that's not the one expected thing that basically kind of happens all the time. Yeah, it's definitely really fun, especially when some teams have started to dabble in the upgrade space and some are just like being like, ah, like it's <laughs> definitely an exciting track to see teams trying to test out certain things and like mm -hmm. really just not have all of the data that they would normally have being at that track adds like an additional level of excitement and something special about having it this early on. Yeah, I'm definitely still all for it. In B1. Cherry Blossoms. We should never go to Japan when it's not cherry blossom season. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I love it so much. I just, everything should always be pink. Give me, give me more pink. Give me more cherry blossoms. It was, like, I feel like they always try to put cherry blossoms over everything for the Japanese GP already, like in all the marketing materials. But now there were actually cherry blossoms on track. Like I said, if we were going to have to watch Max win, I just wanted it to be pink. And that came through. Yeah, they had constantly the shots like through the trees and everything like that. <laughs> the logo for this race is absolutely beautiful with the yes. cherry blossoms like incorporated in it, which also let's get more Grand Prix to like, you know, incorporate cool things in their logos like that. Big fan, another reinforcement, great P1, cherry blossom season only for races. Hey, podcast listeners, Gossip Grid here, your guide to F1's paddock elites. Welcome back to another episode of Gossip Grid, where I give you everything that you need to know about F1 and pop culture. And obviously, we are starting with Paddock Fix, as it is the weekly, race weekly, however the best way to phrase this. Appreciation for Amazing Lou on Instagram, so go check out that account to get everything about Lewis's outfit details. So just some of the big highlights, my favorite pieces from the weekend. Lewis was rocking a Tommy Hilfiger rugby shirt, so still supporting and rocking Tommy Hilfiger fits while he still can. Uh, random identities, faux fur black hoodie, which I would definitely steal, but the moment was all about the red Prada vest from the spring 2024 collection. I mean, Hamilton rocks any kind of vest and just makes every fit incredible. Oscar celebrated his 23rd birthday with a Michael Jordan jersey cake. So 23rd year, no one likes you when you're 23. Congratulations, Oscar, you've made it to like the lame birthday time. George watched some tennis at the Monte Carlo Masters. And again, he's just a really big fan of Novak Djokovic constantly going to tennis matches and it's usually a Djokovic match. Mercedes has this really adorable tradition where they go bowling in Suzuka and they continued that tradition this year and did it again. Had some cute Instagram pics about it. Lego created a life-size W14, which we just can't let that car, you know, live in our memories forever or just forget that it ever existed. And the Lego version's probably faster than the actual W14. The Lego took 15 builders, it took 2,428 hours, and 1,192,937 1 pieces. Wow, it's a lot of Legos. I just want the MP44. Let's see a real size life version of that Legos instead of the W14 maybe. At every single race weekend, RB Jr. has a garage playlist where fans can submit their song picks. They always do one from Danny, Rick, and Yuki. And I always like to see the song playlist and imagine that these playlists are actually playing in the garage and think of the most unhinged or out of pocket song. So this week, the Japan GP, if you want to think that this was real, at some point, best song ever by One Direction was playing in the RB Junior garage. And I will be wrapping up this week's Gossip Grid with Steak Did Haikus in honor of the Japan GP. And I just needed to share the haiku that they wrote specifically about VB. Who has the best butt? His mullet blows in the wind. Bring him some coffee. And that's poetry. And it was a quick gossip grid and a very weird gossip grid. But that's everything I can give you this week for F1 and pop culture. And we will catch you next time. Quack, 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 quack. Quack, 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 quack. Lame duck shenanigans are lame ducking. Quack, 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 quack. <laughs>
Finally remembered to add the sounder to the media board. Boop, boop, quack, 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 quack. I feel like in previous times where we've lame ducked, it's been one or the other with Ferrari or Mercedes, but we definitely saw examples of it on both sides this weekend. Where do you want to start? Ferrari or Mercedes? Where, what are you feeling? Uh, let's go. Let's go Ferrari. We'll we'll save the Mercedes because I don't know that that got me feeling some type of way. Um, yeah, yeah. So. Ferrari seems very um, loosey goosey. It feels like <laughs> a free for all. Like right. to me, it seems like they're just like you think you can race, do it, uh, go for yeah. it. Like <laughs> I, I don't know what I was expecting, and maybe it was because Char- they were on such different strategies, and Leclerc had like a poor qualifying that they're just kind of being like nicer to carlos than i expected ferrari to be yeah and carlos i don't know is just on some kind of like god mission since getting his appendix taken out like it's just all yeah this one's interesting because i don't know if if it would have benefited anyone like i don't think they handled it poorly because i don't Mm -hmm. think charles was that upset about it I think they would have had a and really Carlos disgruntled Carlos. Carlos had the Carlos. pace, like, right. yeah, I think also, like, Carlos had the pace to be on the podium, and, like, they were like, no, you can go for it. They gave him the right to. They didn't tell him not to. And, yeah. again, different strategy type five. Yeah. That's what it comes I, with. I guess I'm just, I'm shocked at, I'm shocked at how well they're handling it. They being Ferrari. It, it's all, like, chill. <laughs> Like, even right. with, the, you know, the like, the one-two, it's like, we're going to celebrate together. And, like, there's still so much of it that just seems like this is how things are. And we're all just going to, like, exist this way. And for, like, the betterment of the team, like, at least right now, we're second, a.k.a. to Red Bull, which means we're number one because it's just that. Right. You know? Like, unless magic happens. But it just seems like they all have their head in one direction and, like, are not necessarily paying attention to so much out- outside noise and very focused on, like, the team internally and, like, making sure, like, that succeeds. Which, again, it's I like, wouldn't have put my money on at the start of the season. Not at all. It's crazy how logical yeah. it is. I'm so confused. I was expecting more of... Quack, 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 quack. But yet yeah. we still we still haven't had a race weekend where it seems like Charles and Carlos are on the pace together at the same time. So, like, I'm interested to see if when that inevitably happens, how much they're going to back Charles, because they better back him, because it would be dumb for them to make their future driver disgruntled and the driver that's leaving happy. But, like, I understand, like, why Leclerc wasn't that upset after this race over everything that happened, or, like, because he had a poor qualifying, and that's why he was in this position. So I think, like, overall, I think Charles ran a better race but he just like was coming so far from behind that it didn't matter. So I just, we said this in our predictions going into this week that I really just wanted a pair of, like I wanted them to both be on the pace and I wanted to see them competitive with each other this weekend. So again, I'm hoping for that for China because it's just, not that I'm hoping for something bad to happen or for Ferrari to have to do team orders. I'm not rooting for that. I'm just like genuinely intrigued what a weekend with both of them more on the pace looks like. Yeah, I, we were talking about it for a couple of weeks. I mean, we were talking about it, you know, pre appendix that that was like we thought that was going to be our first real opportunity of getting to see like them actually you know race each other and get that. And it feels like every week it's just been like, oh, well, we're not or this or there's you know a bad quality and it just doesn't put them in that exact position of a perfect storm for us to see that. I think eventually we will get that, but until we do, it's going to be like, okay, till then it looks like. All fun and games teams, which right. cool, great. Right. Go Ferrari. But also like, is that Ferrari or is that right. another team wearing a yeah. mask? I don't know. <laughs> God, in Fred we trust. Like the way he's it's crazy. Me crazy. into believing into that team in a way in just a little over a year. I'm baffled. 
I remember laughing about his comments of like, it's just about communication. You just need people to talk to each other. It'd be like episode one or two of Gridwalk. I'd be like, yeah, that's definitely just going to fix everything that's happening at Fry. It might have. It really, it really seems like, you know, Fred was making some moves and could be that simple. So. Well, that was a really calm lame duck half of the segment. Uh, Nicole, the floor is yours. What happened at Mercedes? Uh, and how are you feeling about it? Uh, okay, so I'm like, try... Lewis Hamilton's a great person. Things that I know. Mm-hmm. Watching this race and then hearing the radio come in of Lewis basically saying, let me know if I should move out of the way for George. What? Like, I, it's a culmination of, I think, Lewis understanding. One, George would then be future of this. He, they have different, like just a different pace. It's they were on a different strategy. It's just we different, right? It's a different time. strategy. It's like did it like right? And it's like if he should be getting out of the way. But hearing that from Lewis at all, oh. just not great. Not the time. And like, it's bad taste in my mouth of just like this is what I'm watching for like this season, and not like they, you know, Mercedes is fighting for any type of like podium position at the moment. But it just. It, Lewis Hamilton moving over for George Russell just like should not be a sentence that ever comes out of my mouth and I blame Mercedes for it 100%. Like I there's like no other way and there should be no ex- universe just, where that exists except except for the ducks. Um it was such a in the moment reminder to me of honestly how much Mercedes messed this up. So like, yes, Lewis Hamilton is a better person than I will ever be. That he's just going to be that game for a team that did so much work to push him out. Like we've talked enough about how Lewis wouldn't have had to go to Ferrari if Mercedes just treated him the way that he Mm -hmm. should have been treated at that team, not just based on like his longevity with the team, but also who he is as a driver and like, Oh, I won't get back into it. So like, I'm, I'm with you, like hearing it come out of his mouth that he is just like written off the year, essentially, not that he would ever actually not try in a race, but he's like, whatever, I'll do whatever you want for the team game. I want this relationship to end as positively as possible. So I'm just going to do it. Is right. And then even happens for so like, sad. not like a crazy wild finish. Nothing super interesting than continuing to happen. But I mean, it's a step up from last race. It's like, you know, we finished, but like, yeah, yeah. it's. Yeah. With damage though. He did some same damage mm. on the car early yeah. on. Um, so it's, yeah. It was a reminder of how hard this season's going to be as a Lewis Hamilton fan. I didn't Mm -hmm. love it being broadcasted to me that blatantly. I would have preferred to read it on my Lewis Hamilton uh, multi-viewer chat uh, chat, transcript. Transcriber. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. Because in multi-viewer, you get all the radio messages. Fun fact. If you don't use multi-viewer, you're missing out. What are you doing? Um, So I would have loved to read it and be like, huh, maybe that was an AI blunder. It didn't do a good job translating that and moving on. But no, I had to hear it in the live feed. And also, like, you know, if Lewis, like, asks it, you know it's going to happen. So it was so, well, then yeah. it just as soon as, uh, yeah, right. I was just like, okay, so now this is just what I'm going to be waiting to then eventually see, which then right. was very shortly after. But you know sad, what was frustrating? sad duck. What's so frustrating about it is that George couldn't capitalize more on it than he did. Mm -hmm. like what he almost like took out oscar piastri and that is all he did for the rest of the race like it's just it'd be one thing if he let george through and then george just had like this incredible race i'd be like you know what i can Mm -hmm. live with that they have these split strategies but it was like frustrating to watch him let george through and then george like be okay for the rest like it's like no like go be the guy you want it to be the guy so badly go be the guy Mm -hmm. i don't know but we're in for a long season still. We're only at Japan. Oh my god. Oh my god. Empty net. Oh my god. Oh my god. Please. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Anders Lee, I'm going to fucking kiss you. Oh my god. Oh my god. This is the greatest. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. I. Oh my god. I have to go high five my dad. Please hold. Oh my god. Ah, ah, ah. Woo! I don't let my emotions
emotions be affected by sports? Nope. I am okay. Oh my god. I can't stand the Rangers. That is a nightmare. Wow, I suddenly feel like I could breathe. My my heart rate is at 119. Wow, there's something about an empty net goal that is just... Captain, my captain, Anders Lee. I love you. I love, I love sassy. Look, be mad. You suck. <sighs> These are my favorite fan moments from the Japan GP weekend. In P3. Fans had absolutely incredible signs. I could make an entire list of the incredible signs, but my two favorites that I saw were, my last name is Honda, but boy, do I love red flags. Like completely written in the Honda and then Ferrari font, perspectively. <laughs> <laughs> and then my absolute favorite was, sorry, teacher, for skipping school. Ferrari is my excuse. <laughs> That one was really incredible. <laughs> like, oh. 100%. That would be me. And I just love that. Love that, like, commitment from the fans and just really creative signage across the entire race weekend. In P2. Red Bull Jr.'s cherry blossom tree. So, in the paddock outside of their hospitality lounge, Red Bull Jr. created a cherry blossom tree made up of all these little pink messages to Yuki from fans. And it is like a really beautiful Aww. thing. We have a picture of it that we can throw up on the screen or go check out their Instagram. But it was like a really wholesome, like adorable, sweet messages to Yuki. And it clearly paid off throughout the race weekend. I didn't that see good. that. That's so wholesome. It's adorable, adorable, like home race energy. And it's like fully packed. It's a really cool idea. And then, of course... Uh oh, oh! Something happened. I said connecting, and then the the the. Mine also said connecting. Okay, hold on. I'm gonna click it one more time. In B one, the George Russell meme kid. If this wasn't your P one, I was gonna be shocked. I almost brought it up when you said you were talking about fan signs, and then I was like, nope, don't say it. I know it's probably gonna be Nicole's P one. This was oh. so good. <laughs> <laughs> my absolute favorite thing this video during like the it was like mercedes dry it was george and lewis on stage and there's this kid screaming in the audience like absolutely screaming and lewis is like i hear you buddy turns out this kid and his dad are in george russell printed t-shirts and the kid is not his shirt is the george russell meme pose 100 percent striking pose and comes up on stage and him and george hit it together, the kid and his dad are then invited into the garage. It is just absolutely 100% the pose, the moment, all of it, A+, plus, P1 worthy. Japan does not disappoint for some incredible fan moments. And I'm bummed now that we have to wait till April again for next year, but I'm glad that it's early in the season. It's better for cherry blossom time anyway. Sports stats, sports stats. Welcome to the time when we talk about stats and sports, and it may be a fun related, but it's not this time. Na, 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 na. NCAA Women's Edition. <laughs> that was so good. My Move brain is a crazy over, place. I know, really. Yeah. I'm going to take your job. <laughs> I just now want to ask Voiceover Man to. I'm just going to show him that clip and be like, you do this. Like, I want this in voiceover man's voice. <laughs> voiceover man's gonna be like, no, I'm not gonna no. do that. You you can just have Nicole do that. I don't do that. <laughs> we'll bribe him. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while, something happens in the sporting world where one of us will text each other in our grid watch chat and be like, I know this is an F1, but can we please talk about it on the podcast? And this is one of those times where I need to obsess over the numbers we're seeing from the Women's National Championship games this weekend uh, so this is not only is this not f1 this is like american niche basketball story collegiate basketball story <laughs> but nothing will get me more hyped than people realizing that if you invest in women's sports or just like women in sport in general that like oh you'll actually like make a crap ton of money and this is something we should invest in not just because it's the right thing to do but it's financially beneficial for everyone so <laughs> the Women's National Championship Tournament 
happened this past weekend. That was a mouthful. Women's March Madness happened this weekend. The national championship game had 18.7 million average viewers. The game peaked at 24 million viewers. For context, in the United States, this is NFL numbers. In the mm -hmm. US, F1 is lucky when it hits a million viewers. NASCAR hits 2 million viewers. Here, here, I'm going to put this in even more context. Football in America reigns supreme. So like, yeah, really, really big NFL games, like normally average around these numbers. But Amazon purchased the rights to stream Thursday night football games for the NFL because it was the easiest, simplest way to get viewership onto Prime Video for Amazon mm -hmm. in the United States. The average viewers of a Thursday night football game was less than 10 million viewers. This was nearly double that. Double. And this was a women's basketball game, a sport that people claim no one cares about. No one cares, oh, apparently. I just, it, it's been incredible to watch just in like a trend and you know, I feel like we've seen most recently in like women's basketball, like women's hockey. There's just like this like resurgence of interest soccer. and like soccer, like I, it all over the place and like high attendance numbers across the board. And now it's we were talking off pod about, you know, like seeing people really begin to understand the value of like women's sports and how much money it can make you. And that's really cool. To like, so, to be like, okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. To further put this 18.7 million viewers in context, this was the most watched basketball game, men's or women's, college or pro, basketball game since 2019, since pre-pandemic, before like the streaming overload that made all these numbers weird. This is the biggest number since pre-streaming like streaming chaos. This is the most watched sporting event since 2019 in the US, excluding the NFL and the Olympics. So like, again, everyone watches the NFL, then there's the Olympics, and then there's this women's basketball game. That is, a, that gives it such perspective of like what a huge deal this was. Yeah. Like it's undeniable at that point. Yeah, I have some more fun numbers to share because I was digging into this. So it drew a larger audience than any of last year's non-NFL sporting events, except for one sporting event. So, for context, Georgia TSU college football game on ESPN got 17.2 average million viewers. Alabama Georgia on CVS got 17.5. Then this national championship game for women's basketball got 18.7. The only game that did better was Michigan Ohio State on Fox. And Michigan Ohio State is the football game. Wow. This is breaking my It's literally my called the game. Col it is the game. It is the yeah. game. Um that's yeah. breaking my brain of The only other things above it other than this Michigan Ohio State football game <laughs> is Olympics. NFL games. Yes. And the Olympics. Yes. Crazy. So like it's not only like cuz it's a lot of like it's the highest thing except for football. It's like no no no, it's the biggest thing in the last year except for Michigan, Ohio State and the NFL. Football. Like right. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, what insane context. I'm excited to see where this goes. It's also going to be really interesting to see how this potentially tracks maybe to the WNBA. Like their season mm -hmm. turned around so fast. It's like middle of May. Or so, like it, it's yeah. crazy how quickly that and goes. And Caitlin so. Clark is right away. Yeah. Going into it, so yeah, I mean, the WNBA has already talked about how they're putting a focus on, like, continuing these collegiate storylines. And that with that quick of, like, a number of weeks, I think, like, you mm -hmm. can continue that storyline and really be, like, riding that momentum. So, like, that's something they should be taking advantage of. Right. All right, I have one more set of stats for you to <laughs> blow your mind with this. So to put into context how big and exciting of a season Iowa had, they started their season at a preseason game that was held in the Iowa football stadium for 55,646 fans attended a preseason game to see Caitlin Clark and oh, Iowa play. And then their last game of the season packed an NBA arena. Cause again, 
proof that this is something that's such a big deal with prices that nearly doubled the male counterparts national mm -hmm. championship game. But I think the biggest attendance figure that's been I, I, blowing my mind is that the day before the national championship game that they played in that packed NBA arena, um, they opened up for a free practice that you had just had to apply to tickets for. And there were 19,000 people who applied to get tickets to attend a free practice. Yeah. This podium is things that happen that is allowing me to be Delulu crazy, insane, whatever word you want to put in there, but I'm basically convincing myself that Sebastian Vettel is going to return to the Formula One grid. Yes, that was an incredible mouthful, but basically things that happen that make me think that Seb's returning or allow me to convince myself. I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to get right into the podium now. A bonus mention because Gridwalk struggles with self-editing. We mentioned this last week, but Seb did test a race car and I know it wasn't an F1 car, but he tested a race car and that makes me think that someone misses racing. <laughs> I said too many words. I didn't give you the opportunity to hit the That's button. okay. I still clicked the button. <laughs> yeah. But, but, yeah. yeah. He tested a endurance racing car, was considering it for next year. That just means that he's considering racing which means he could consider F1. There's an itch. There's some kind of itch. Right. We'll right. see if it's scratched or if uh -huh. it just needs F1 back. Do it, do it, do it. In P3. Audi is joining the grid full-time in 2026. We've also talked about this a little bit before, but I will continue to be optimistic at a potential Sebastian Vettel return until told otherwise, because Audi keeps mentioning that they would like a German driver, a German influence on the grid. And guess there's there's a really famous German driver who, you know, would be really great for press and would make so many people happy if he was driving on the grid. So hope. In P2. Toto said some interesting quotes this week. All right, I pulled the part of the quote that I thought was relevant to this conversation. Sebastian is some, oh, and he was specifically asked about if he was considering Sebastian Vettel in the press conference. Sebastian is coming like now, like a question to ask Toto of just like, right. so who's going to go in the seat? Who do you right. think's going to go in the seat? Who, like, what about any, this driver? Name a person. What about this person? What about this person? SpongeBob SquarePants going to be your second driver? But, 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 but. Like, it's who isn't yes. Toto being asked about to take that seat? But that aside, this is allowing me to be delusional. Sebastian is someone you can never discount. His track record is phenomenal, and sometimes maybe taking a break is also good to evaluate what's important for you and refine your motivation. Huh? 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 Lots of words. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He also went on to like say lots of other words about like how he has no idea who the driver is going to be, and they're evaluating lots of people. But I ignore that. He sounds very positive about Seb. It's not not Seb. Right. He didn't rule it out and laugh and he say no. He didn't definitely say, ha, ah, we would not want yeah. him. And we know that they've had conversations. We don't know what about, but we know that they've talked on the phone recently. In B1. Seb said some words. And I will now tell you those words. I'm following the sport. I see what's going on. And it a return might be appealing and interesting, but it really depends on the full package because it's a big commitment as well with all the other stuff going on outside of the driving activities. And again, I will say that's not a no. Not, not a no. There, there was no no in that. There's no there, no. That was a, I'm watching. He also went on to say some more words about how like he would only come back for a competitive car, a really competitive package. And it does seem like there might be a Red Bull seat opening up and a Mercedes seat opening up. There might be an Aston Martin seat opening up again. They left on good terms. And again, the Audi seat. I don't know. I think there might be some interesting packages as Seb is looking for. Options. We like options. You never know. This is again, like a circus of a sport. I would not be surprised if it eventually happened. What a God, it'd be movie overjoyed. writes itself. I would be overjoyed. Nicole, this is my favorite story. We're talking about this entire episode. I was so excited. Yay! 
we love when like products and things and brands that we love become more present and do cool things in motorsports. So, Kathleen Leach is returning for this year's Indy 500. Last year, she was partially sponsored by Elf Cosmetics. And it has announced that they are going to be her primary sponsor this year. So not only is she returning for the Indy 500, but it's going to be in an elf livery car. And I'm unbelievably obsessed with this car. I love it, love it, love it, love it. So I'm so hyped that she's coming back and racing again. But I'm also just so hyped that it's in this pink elf cosmetics car. Yeah. Uh, we, if you heard us like fangirl about the Charlotte Tilbury livery, we love a fun livery. We love a makeup livery. This is, and it's pink. This is what like Alpine should take notes. And this being like the full first primary sponsorship of a beauty brand in the Indy 500, like huge. It's, this is a really monumental moment to be happening. Um, hasn't happened at all in the sport. And it's kind of just, again, showing the path and direction and current presence of, of, female fan base within motorsports to be putting that much money and investment and time, not only for, you know, the, this isn't like the first time they're doing any sort of sponsorship, but to be expanding this investment to be such a strong focus. And it, you know, really sends Behind that Behind the curtain, we're, we both work in marketing. So we understand the decisions that go into something like this. So it, Elf signed on last year and had this partnerships, partnership with Catherine. And it clearly worked well because they would not have returned this year and upped their investment in her and in the IndyCar series if it didn't work. So you could not see a more clear line of makeup brand invests in sponsoring a female driver in motorsports. It works. Let me go spend more money in that. Because if it, if it didn't influence things last year, they just wouldn't have spent the money this year. So it's mm -hmm. it's just so tangibly positive that this is happening right now. Yeah. It's a very solid option where based on whatever was happened last year, whatever response they received, you know, whatever they saw their ROI could have remained the same, could have done less. No, they were yeah. like pedal to the metal, extend, do more with same driver, like really reinforcing that partnership. They talk a lot about how they like really see Catherine is like aligned with their mission and is a great representation for their brand and that they just align really well together. And it seems like to be a really powerful, great partnership. And uh, I'm excited to see kind of where it continues and grows and whether Elf branches out into other areas of motorsports, I feel like could be their next step here. I wouldn't be surprised and be excited to see it. I'm also, will always... I always feel better and I'm always happier when there's a female driver representing on the grid for the Indy 500. And she's driving for the Dale Cone racing team this year, which she hasn't partnered with before. I would love for someone to give her like a Penske, like partner with one of the top teams one of these mm -hmm, years, mm -hmm. because like what the way she outperformed her teammates in qualifying who had the full-time IndyCar seats last year. Um, and of course it was, the worst team on the grid, but she still outperformed all of her full-time teammates to outqualify them. I would love to see her be put into a bigger spotlight. I would love to see more women on the grid this year for the Indy 500, but that's me being greedy. I will be happy with today's announcements and just hope for more. Yes, we'll take glass half full, we'll look at, but yes. does not mean that there can't be more, but yeah. Very excited. The car. This it's so it's pretty. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, I also want to point out that in the whole press release announcement for this, um, her outfit was sick, but that's not what I actually wanted to point out. That was a side point out. I wanted to point out that on the like oil changing set piece they had, they had lip oil change. And I just thought that was incredibly lip clever. Oil change is incredible. Great. Yeah. Kind of going back to the partnership that Catherine has with Elf and just overall this entire thing all together um, had a really amazing quote talking about like the impact that this has and just kind of like the overall meaning of it. So Catherine has said, together with DCR, Honda, and Elf, 
We will truly empower women who are breaking barriers, pushing boundaries, and testing the limits by giving them the confidence and a path forward, realizing their dreams, whatever they may be. And this is also kind of a very similar thing that we're also seeing like within F1 Academy. It's that breaking down barriers. It's the, you know, it's possible if you see yourself there. So it's that providing access, getting more female in motorsports so that younger females see females and be like, that is something I can do. You see it, you believe it, that type of access. And all of these parties are aligned with that mission. And that's, you know, really important to be having in a major race in space, like in the Indy 500. It's the final lap hitting every F1 garage. Get ready for this week's Yellow Sector Notes. All right, there's still no update on the sexual assault investigation to Christian Horner. Um, I am dramatically losing hope that the Red Bull Corporation is going to do anything. I'm looking at you, F1. This is unpleasant. And maybe we could stop with the live look-ins to Christian Horner in the middle of the race. I find them triggering. Um, but we're going to continue to hope that the victim in all of this is safe and surrounded by as much support as possible. And this will continue to be the weekly Yale Psycho Note for Red Bull until we have a resolution to all of this, because I refuse to promote anything that's going on with Red Bull. All right, Ferrari. Charles had a tribute helmet in honor of the late Jules Bianchi this past weekend. It really was an incredible helmet um, and emotional, like every Suzuka race is. McLaren had a special livery this weekend. Not that anyone could really tell. And that's not a, not, uh, like, I think the artists did the best they could with the very, very small amount of space that McLaren gave the artists to work with. So not about the artists, about McLaren. Like, if you're gonna do fun liveries, like, do fun liveries. Aston Martin claimed that its upgrades cured its tire degradation issues this weekend, which is bad news for us Mercedes fans if this is true. And Japan is really rough on tires, so it's probably an accurate assessment of the Aston Martin upgrade. Mercedes, on the other hand, did not end up bringing their rumored planned upgrades to this race, but they did change their livery. And yes, I read a tweet about that juxtaposition many times this weekend. <laughs> Junior are, cre are claiming that Ricardo is slower than Yuki Tsunoda, not because he's slower than Yuki Tsunoda, but because definitely the chassis of his car is broken and does not work. I wonder when we last heard that. I don't know, it, I think he was driving for the Borgi team? They were making the same, I don't know, I can't fully remember. But I guess we'll see if that's true when he gets a new chassis in China. Despite not scoring points this weekend, Haas continues to impress with competitive performances on the fringes of points. By competitive performances, I mean for them. We're measuring them against Haas's standards. But this has still been very impressive. Uh, they are actually rumored to be bringing upgrades to the Chinese GP next week, which is the earliest I remember Haas ever bringing upgrades in a season. So I think the good vibes are rolling over at Haas, which I was not expecting to say this year, but sure. The good vibes are definitely not rolling in Williams, where they probably, it would, they would have had to work hard to have a worse weekend. After Alex was taken out by Ricardo at the beginning of the race, and Logan did everything possible to DNF. Um, and now I just ask the question, do you believe, let, and let me know in the comments, if they're actually gonna have two full cars ready for the Chinese GP? Because at this point, not only, like, we know that they're struggling to bring a spare chassis, but it's not even about that. It's about spare parts on all the cars and having things repaired and ready to go in time. So I'm nervous. All right. Steak managed pit stops that were not embarrassing this weekend. Yeah, yeah, hold on. Let me... There's... We, we, should, we should really um, celebrate this. Not a mess. Not a total mess. <laughs> um, and by not embarrassing, they were about a second uh, slower in the pits than every other team, but that's much better than 15 seconds slower. So yeah, third team principal says their goal is to just be consistent right now and they'll work on being fast later. I really don't know what happened year over year. Like, did they lose all of their pit stop engineers? Like, ah, it's kind of confusing. Um, and because so much happened at the Japanese GP, we really didn't discuss anything about Alpine today. And there was actually a teammate collision that happened at Alpine this past race weekend. And it does seem like these two are definitely on the verge of some kind of explosion. And it's too bad and really disappointing that the car is too slow for this to be a super engaging story. Because this was even just last year where the car was mediocre and they had that one-off podium. It felt like we were building to an exciting storyline here that got a bucket of cold water since the car can't do anything exciting. 
But that's the grid walk for April 11th, 2024 completed. How was my sector time today, Nicole? Faster than they built the Lego life-size W14. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Gridwalk. Thank you to our co-creators, Nicole Katz and Brianna Klein. Thank you to our four-legged executive producers and me, voiceover man. Don't forget to subscribe, like the video, turn on auto downloads, and leave a review to provide us with a fresh set of tires for the next week's show. You can follow us on social media at Gridwalk Show for daily content. We will be back to walk the Formula One grid every Thursday, and we will see you for the post-Gridwalk debrief in the comments. Today definitely felt more like a grid brat diet than a grid walk. <laughs>